everyone. Video that I always try to achieve every machine I build, trying to make that perfect silent machine. So I'm always a fan of the passive equipment, which is great. He's tried it before, tried it again. Um, I bought one of these before for a well, it was a Iverbridge T processor. It didn't work out great, so it's not the camera. But I'm hoping. Second time lucky. Exactly the same heatsink, but for the AM4. These are only rated for, I believe it says somewhere on the box, or not. You think they would have rated up to 45 watt? Uh, maximum TDB, 47 watt. So, I'm going to try it on the Ryzen Pro I have, the 4750G to be exact. And I'm going to use the 35 watt TDP profile to see if I can use this heatsink reliably with that machine. Let's quickly open this up. I mean, it's pretty much just a couple of screws, some washers. Use a manual on a little phone which you can take a picture of, and that is a sticker on the sticker, that's weird. And got to give me points for tight packaging. I think this happened last time, so why I haven't got the old box, the Intel version. Come on, how you come? So there we go. Now, pretty certain it's identical to the. That's interesting. The Intel one is slightly taller. Is that the case? Let's have a look. It is slightly taller. Yet the AMD one, I don't know if you can see that, is actually. Slightly wider. Oh, so there is a difference. I'm assuming there's the exact same amount of metal in the surface area. But yeah, so they are slightly different dimensions. Mounting holes in the bottom. Now this this is a bit of a fiddle to actually mount. As you can see, there's no general bracket. What you do is use the screws from the back of the board, plonk this on, and install. Come to a bit of Free thermal grease, which I may replace. We'll see how the stop performance works. So let's get this installed, shall we? So to get this installed, it's quite simple. You do not need the typical AM4 bracket that can go away. It just literally sits on top. Obviously, picky orientation, but that way is probably the best. But it doesn't really, yeah, it'd be that way, I suppose. So, as you can see, it's quite substantial, but it just installs from the back. It's a bit fiddly, but that's hopefully it'll be worth it. Some washers, which I'm not going to use for this particular test because I will use this for another time. I mean, they're sticky washers, therefore, keeping the screws in place when you're doing this. Oops. As mentioned, it's quite simple. Obviously, don't keep the plastic on. I'm going to use a default thermal paste for now, because it should be adequate. Just flip it over. As mentioned, get your orientation correct. And essentially just wind it up. 
and drop the screws in. It is that simple. Like I said, a bit fiddly because you have to do it from behind. And it is a bit of guesswork to get the first screw in. But once that's in, it should be pretty straightforward. I mean, it's hard to. Notice this is done by feel. I did find previously some VRM cooling on some boards. Um, in fact, it was an ASRock board. Interfered with this heatsink. I know it's designed not to do that, but not every board is made the same. This one is. Hmm. Actually, I think I think we're okay. Just looking, it looks like it's going to be very close. I mean, it shouldn't interfere because there's supposed to be like a safe space around the socket for heat sinks. But I think Arctic cooling have gone a little a bit too close to the edge with this, and it has interfered before. I mean, the ASRock board I tried it on before, the cooling was atrocious, probably because I couldn't get a good seal with the thermal paste and the heatsink, because of that aforementioned VRM cooling. So, let's get all this screwed on nice and tight. That's nice and tight. Let's get another turn just in case. Yeah, it's nice and tight. So there we go. It's installed. Very close to the RAM slots. And as I mentioned, then you can see that, but very close to the BRMs. But it fits. That's all that really matters. Now it looks quite big, and it is. But this will fit in something like the Silverstone Milo, in a very low small case. Um, it won't fit in like a Dan A4, because it's way too big. I have looked at some other um, heat sinks, one from Silverstone, that come with a fan, but are much lower. I want to try and see if that works on a, let's say like a T processor. Or if, or if I can get my hands on a G version of this. But for now, we're going to try it with this. Hindsight, I should probably change it to 35 watt TDP before doing this, but it doesn't matter. We should be fine. So let's quickly install this on the on my little test rig, and let's get going. I tested this at 65 watts. For this video, I tried it very quickly at 35 and the results were pretty much exactly the same. So before I ran some more tests, I set it to 65 and this is what we got. First I let the machine uh, hit a base temperature. The ambient temperature of the room was 19.5 degrees and it seemed to idle around 45. I then ran the CPU Z benchmark which gave me a result of 74 degrees max so pretty hot already I then quickly moved on to Cinebench without letting it cool down probably the mistake but it's what we did and it hit 77 degrees max so we're getting pretty hot already Next I ran the Final Fantasy 15 benchmark which I ran once and by the end I hit 83 degrees max. I then did the same with the Final Fantasy 14 benchmark which hit a temperature of 74 degrees. So still very hot but still below the 95 C 
max temperature that the CPU is rated for. Next, I tried the standard pass mark benchmark which tests a bit of everything in the system and that at by the end hits 80 degrees which which is, which is okay but still once again hot i then wanted to see where the machine tops out and when, when throttling occurred and what temperature it would settle at under a cpu heavy test so i used 3d mark and I use fire strike and I put the physics test on a loop and I let that loop for about half an hour and it stabilized around about 92 degrees it hit there and didn't go any higher at that point the CPU was throttling itself to keep the temperatures down so it hits 92 degrees and is, is it's fine. It doesn't crash. Nothing bad happens. It's just very hot. I wouldn't want to run any kind of computer components this hot for a long time. But it shows that it is stable. It's just throttling will occur. What I'm more concerned about is the motherboard temperature. During fire strikes physics test, it hit 80 degrees for the motherboard, which isn't great at all. That will probably kill the motherboard after, let's say, a couple of years, so it's not good. That's way too hot, and that's the only problem with using a passive system. You need to keep a very close eye on the motherboard temperatures, um, and 80 degrees is a bit on the hot side. Now, after ending the test, I was curious to see how long it took to cool back down. It took round about half an hour for it to stabilize. And it never hit 45 degrees anymore. It hit 49 degrees low. We were floating around about 50, 55. So that's with an open bench, of course. But you can see it's running very hot. I wouldn't recommend using this heatsink with a 65 watt CPU. So what can we do to try and get these temperatures down to allow for a passive uh, performance? Well, there's a couple of things. First, you can disable the turbo. This can normally be done in the BIOS settings, but not always. So under Windows at least, you can set up a power profile. I normally set it to power saving and you can go in and you can set the maximum the CPU is allowed to run at. And if you set a maximum of 99%, it will run just under its uh, base clock speed, but turbo will never trigger, which can keep the thermals down considerably. Unfortunately, you will lose performance, but it's not going to be a humongous amount and if you want a silent experience it might be worth it. You can also take a hand at undervolting the CPU that can gain a few degrees that varies again between CPUs. This one in particular undervolts a little bit as you can see here it shaves off a couple of degrees, not a massive amount. There's something strange going on with Zen 2 CPUs regarding undervolting. They don't seem to quite do what you would expect, and you seem to lose performance very quickly. And it's, it's a bit strange. So with Zen 2 in particular, have a, ha have a play with some undervolting, but don't expect amazing results. But... That's about it for this heatsink without using any kind of fan or anything like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a fan next to the heatsink. It's just going to be a case fan. I'm just going to place it on the right hand side here to get some airflow pushing across the heatsink to see if it makes any real difference because while 
this is a passive heatsink. A lot of passive systems, or the way they're designed, seem to expect at least some kind of airflow, which kind of defeats the point of a passive system. Though if you get a large case fan, you can have it spinning very slowly and get some decent airflow. So with this rigged up setup, we can have a look see if it makes any difference. So I'll repeat the same tests. So in CPU Z, we got a peak of 36 degrees. In Cinebench, it was 49 degrees. And in Final Fantasy 15, it was 52 degrees. And in the stress test for 3D Mark, this was the physics test again on a loop. We hit a peak of 62 but it settled down around the 54 mark. But most importantly, the motherboard temperature peaked at 42, so much, much cooler than what we had with no fan at all. So in conclusion, what have we learned? Well, we've learned that this particular heat sink while it is not substantial enough, despite its hefty size, to cool a 65 watt AMD APU. But let's be honest, it never claimed to be. Though I will say that I have been impressed with the results. Here's the front of the box. Since I was expecting this to throttle almost immediately, but it wasn't until I did the stress test with 3D Mark that this actually hit 90 degrees and started to throttle itself. And that took about I think 20 minutes. So that's that's pretty impressive just for this heatsink and no airflow. Of course, when we added the fan, even though it was off center and wasn't blowing optimally. It reduced the thermals massively, so that's not a surprise. So if you did pair this with a 35 watt TDP uh, AMD APU, I don't think they do CPUs at the moment, at that wattage, this should in theory work. It's worked better than I, it did with some Intel processors that I've used in the past. So that's very impressive. So all in all, I'm very happy with this. I just need now need to get my hands on a G processor. So that's all for now. This is, has been the Alpine AM4 passive. I won't say review, more look into because I haven't used the right CPU. But as always, thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and if you want to, subscribe below. Check out some of my other videos. I'm trying to post these every four to five days, I'm trying to grow this channel. Little light on content at the moment, but we're getting there. But until the next video, goodbye.